Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk of the Mathematical Consciousness Science online seminar series. This seminar series aims to explore the role of mathematics in the scientific study of consciousness and hopes to connect researchers who have an interest in this topic. While every session of the seminar consists of a talk and discussions, the latter are not recorded and the following will only contain the talk. We hope you will enjoy it. For further information, please visit our website, seminar.math-consciousness.org. Representation is a, it's a key concept in, uh, in neuroscience and in cognitive science. And, and so I, I suppose it's relevant also to studies of consciousness. Um, it's often considered self-evident that uh, we have representations of the world and that we use them to behave. Uh, and since brains control behavior, we think that there must be neural representations. But what is exactly meant by a representation or neural representation is uh, not often discussed and often quite unclear. So in this talk, what I want to do mostly is to make you think about what a representation might be. Uh, and also, I will, I will argue that the concept of neural representation, at least as is typically used in neuroscience, is uh, essentially flawed. Uh, so, first of all, why do we think that there are mental representations? Well, a first reason is just intuitive. At any instant, we are experiencing something, and that something may, well, has um, a relation with our physical surroundings, but it can be an indirect relation. And in any case, we have a subjective experience which depends on the world, but which is not the world. So, so it's a mental phenomenon and we call that representation of the world. And so representation is something that is about the world, but at the same time, it's something that must be accessible by the organism. Uh, then in science, another way to justify representations in particular in cognitive science is when trying to explain behavior. That is to say that uh, it seems that representations are necessary to explain some aspect of animal or human behavior. So I'm giving a simple example, which is a, a cat listening to noise, uh, listening to mice in the grass. And so there are, it cannot see the, the mice, they're in the grass. And at some point, the cat will hear a little scratching noise and it will run towards the source and, and maybe eat the mouse. And this is quite amazing if you think about it. If you try to build a system that does that, for example, it's quite complicated to do. And one reason why it's complicated to do is because the behavior of the cat seems to be determined by the special position of the mouse, but it is mediated by the sound that the mouse makes and that are captured at the two ears. And the mouse at a given position can produce a variety of sounds, all from the same position, but, but giving very different acoustic waves. And so the cat seems to behave as a function of an abstracted feature of sound, which is its expected direction. And this expectation, we call a representation of the mouse's location for the cat. And so the representation is something abstract and it can be used in different settings at different situations. For example, the, the cat could uh, run after a mouse or it could flee from the source of the, the sound. So depending on the situation, the same abstracted feature of the sounds can be used differently by the organism. And so representation is something that can be used uh, flexibly. And finally, another key feature of representation is that it can be verified. And this means that uh, in this in the present case that the cat runs and then it may find the mouse or it doesn't. So the expectation can be right or it can be wrong. And that's a key feature of representations. They can be correct or not. They have a truth value. So you have here three of the essential features of representations in um, what they explain about behavior. It's a flexible ab abstraction of sensory data which can be used flexibly in behavior and it is verifiable by the organism itself. Uh, 
Now, this is the behavioral argument for representations, but representations are not something that we observe directly. It's a theoretical concept that we use that is central in our explanation of behavior. And so that's why Tony Chemerow in one of his books called it the dark matter of the brain. It's something that has to be there in order to make sense of behavior, something that has particular properties like abstraction, verifiability. But what is important to note here is that all the scientific arguments about representations are expressed at the level of persons, persons who behave and not at the level of brains. So when we say that there must be neural representations, implicitly the rationale is mental representations are necessary to explain behavior. The brain generates behavior and therefore there must be neural representations. But the difficulty with, uh, with that is that so far representations have been presented as properties of persons be, uh, behaving in the world. And so what do we mean exactly by a neural representation? A neuron is not an organism that behaves. So what does it, what does it mean exactly? And so what it means, what it's meant usually, we can see by looking at some examples. So here's an example from an fMRI study. And in this study, which I think um, uses typical phrasings, you can see words written in different areas of the brain. And so the first sentence of the study says, the meaning of language is represented in regions of the cerebral cortex, collectively known as the semantic system. So you, you see the use of uh, the word represented. And in what sense do these areas represent the meaning of words? Well, technically, these areas activate when those words are heard, of course, statistically. And so it's a meaning of correspondence between something in the world, uh, the words, and something in the brain. And so this sense, technical sense of a correspondence is the concept of a neural code. And it's a very old concept. It's several decades old, at least. You can see um, here uh, an extract of uh, an appendix of a seminal review on neural codes, which was published 50 years ago. And at the top of this appendix, you can see an illustration of uh, showing hieroglyphs, which are identified to neural activity. And so neural activity is identified to hieroglyphs that need to be deciphered. And so these codes are called explicitly forms of representation. Uh, and so you have probably noticed already that neural codes are everywhere in the neuroscience literature. We talk about neural codes for pain, the brain encodes and decodes stimuli. We want to crack the neural code. So what is it about uh, exactly? Well, technically, uh, an, a code is a correspondence, which of course can be uh, meant in a statistical sense. It's a correspondence between something in the world and, and something in the brain. To be more precise, the correspondence is between something we observers, external observers observe in the world, or we produce like a stimulus, and something we measure in the brain. And so the technical sense is entirely from the perspective of the observer. But that is not at all what we mean by representation because a representation, if we take seriously what it's supposed to explain, a representation is supposed to be the basis of behavior, not just to correlate. And so it must be from the perspective of the organism and not from the external observer. Uh, so here's a quote from a neuroscience paper on, on neural coding, which is, I think, representative of the literature on this subject. And uh, it says a stimulus activates a population of neurons in various areas of the brain. So here you have the technical sense of a correspondence. And to guide behavior, the brain must correctly decode this population response and extract the sensory information as reliably as possible. And in the second sentence, we have something else um, more related to representations. So let's just take a couple of minutes to, uh, to look at this sentence. Right, the interesting phrase is this, the brain 
must correctly decode. Now, this is interesting. What does it mean the brain must correctly decode? A decoder is something that maps the activity of neurons, so something which is in the biological domain, to something that is in the world outside the brain, or even actually in general, something in an abstract domain, like a domain of abstract properties. So of course it cannot be literally true that the brain maps uh, activity of neurons to something outside the brain or something abstract. So you have here an example of a metaphorical use. What is meant exactly, it's not so clear. Uh, but another interesting aspect in this sentence is the word correctly. So whatever is being decoded, whatever it means, it must be correct. And so here it is assumed that this correspondence also has a truth value. It's something that can be right or wrong. So really here, it is assumed that this neural code is actually a representation, something that the brain uses, something that has a truth value. Now, the problem is that um, the idea that it is a representation is not at all implied by the technical sense of our correspondence. It's not sufficient to just have a correlate for this to be a representation for the organism. So there are some assumptions there that are not um, explained. And then, and in passing, the quote also makes a few other assumptions which are also typical of the literature. First, there's the assumption that the brain is functionally organized in two dual parts. There's one part that is in charge of coding stimuli. And then there's another part which uh, is in charge of decoding stimuli. And the second other implicit assumption is, well, the, that the quote implicitly disposes of the concept of an organism. Because an organism is something autonomous that has its own activity oriented towards its individual goals. But here, neural activity is exclusively interpreted as responses to stimuli. It's information about the stimuli. There is just no place for autonomous activity. Whatever is not implied by the stimulus must be noise in this interpretation. Now, this idea of neural codes identified to representations is very particular because it is based on non-trivial assumptions that are questionable, at least that need to be substantiated. And so now I want to show you that a neural code cannot actually be a representation that is cannot have the features, the three features that I explained at the beginning. Uh, and so one of the key concepts in neural coding is the tuning curve, classical concept. Uh, it's commonplace to say that neurons encode properties in tuning curves. And what does it mean? So I'll take a very simple example, which um, is an, an experiment where you would vary the wavelength of a light stimulus and then you measure the firing of the neuron as a function of that wavelength. And so you find this bell curve and we say that this neuron encodes color. And what do we mean by that? Well, it means technically that there is a correspondence between color and firing rate so that if I'm given the firing rate, I can infer the color, of course, with some uncertainty. Now, this is true only in the context of this experiment, but if I change the light intensity, for example, then the tuning curve might be different. And if it's different, then, um, and I don't specify light intensity, then there is a confusion between these two dimensions. And if I'm just given the firing rate, I cannot actually infer the color anymore, which means the, that if I'm just giving the firing rate, just the information of the firing rate of that neuron, I cannot actually uh, infer color. So when we say that the neuron encodes color, it's quite misleading because to decode it, we don't use just information in the firing rate, but also information about the context, namely information that only the experimenter knows, the experimental protocol. That's what um, Francis Crick called the fallacy of the otherwise neuron. And in reality, what we should say more accurately is not that this neuron encodes color, but more modestly that the, this neuron is sensitive to color. But if we say that it's just sensitive to color, then we're not talking about a representation anymore because, because it lacks the feature of abstraction. It's just something that some measurement that varies with some other measurement. 
so to qualify for a representation of color, you should have something that is invariant with other dimensions, somehow the orthogonal property of a tuning curve. So you could imagine, for example, that different neurons have different tuning curves, and maybe the relative activity of the two neurons is invariant to intensity. That's the kind of thing that you would need to show. Now, of course, you might think straw man, science, color scientists are very well aware of that. Uh, and that's probably true. And I chose this example precisely because it's obvious, um, it's easy to explain, but the concept of neural neuro representation as codes is so strong in the field that you will find the fallacy in, in many situations in, uh, in many other settings as well. And I'll just give one example that I know well, which is in the auditory field. Um, and you will find, for example, a lot of literature claiming that there is a rate code for sun location. And more precisely, there's the idea that the location of a sound is encoded in the difference in mean activation between two hemispheric structures in the brainstem or in the auditory cortex. And the basis for this claim is always a correlate between that measurement and the location of, a, of the stimulus. In other words, a tuning curve. And yet it's known that these tuning curves also depend on many other features of sounds like intensity, timbre, and things like that. And in fact, if you look at the older literature, you will find that a lesion in one hemisphere impairs sound localization in just one hemifield. So that's a contradiction. And if you stimulate electrically in just one hemifield, well, you will find that a greater stimulation triggers an orientation movement towards the same direction, actually, but with a more parts of the body. So it seems that it's not true that uh, sound location is encoded uh, in the uh, difference in total hemispheric activity. And yet you will still find this claim in a lot of the modern literature. I guess because this identification between a code and a, and a representation is so strong. Now, responses of neurons vary with many dimensions of experimental stimuli. Every, everyone knows that, I guess. And what is even more important, I think, is that neural responses do not depend only on stimuli. They also depend, for example, on what the animal is trying to do. For example, you can measure tuning curves in the visual cortex of a monkey. And depending on what you are asking the monkey to do, you will get different tuning curves that are informative of different aspects of of the scene. And this tells us two things. It tells us that what we usually call neural representations do not actually the uh, have the feature of abstraction. They are just actually, you know, sensitivity to various dimensions. And secondly, that neural activity is not just responses to stimuli. They also depend on other things. Uh, now let's talk about what it means more concretely in one of the leading representational theories of the brain, which is the Bayesian brain. So I quote, the brain represents information probabilistically by coding and computing with probability density functions. That is to say that you have certain stimulus properties that are represented by the firing rate across a population of neurons, which, which are supposed to represent somehow the likelihood of the properties of the stimulus. And so concretely, this is a connectionist model, which explains how these computations of likelihoods are, are done. So you have a number of neurons, the response to the same stimulus, uh, the stimulus has a certain property and the neurons respond with a number of spikes. And from this population response, this, this is the representation, you can calculate the likelihood that uh, the stimulus property had a certain value. And you do this calculation by a weighted sum, a weighted sum of the spike counts weighted by synaptic weights. And the synaptic weights must be determined by the tuning curves of the neurons for this likelihood to be accurate. And so the authors say that we, are, we have here a simple biological decoder the reason is that the calculation that is done uses uh, spike counts and and synaptic weights. So that's that's why they mean what they mean by 
biological decoder, simple biological decoder. But the problem with that is that since the tuning curves are context dependent, if the context changes, then this computation is going to be wrong because the weights will not correspond anymore to the tuning curves corresponding to the new situation. So for every scene, you will need to do a different calculation with different synaptic weights. So for this thing to work, you would have to imagine that the decoder and therefore the synaptic weights are going to flexibly adapt to each situation. And I mean, why not? That's the theory. The problem is that nowhere is this explained. No, um, nowhere I could find how this happens concretely. So, um, so that's a gap in the theory. But we can ask a more general question. And the question is, is it possible even in principle to encode the world, to encode perceptual scenes with tuning curves? That is to say that you have a number of neurons that are sensitive to many properties, different properties, and from the frying rate of these neurons, you can infer somehow a model of the scene parameterization of the scene. Well, the problem is that a variable is something that quantifies a property of an object, like uh, the orientation of a bar, uh, contrast, and so on. But what if there are two bars, or if there are no bars and something else than a bar? We, in that case, you would need two variables, or you would need, well, the same number of variables, but they would refer to something else. So the problem here is that we would need a different set of variables with a different meaning, but here we are representing variables of the model of the world, but we're not representing the model itself. So this type of representation is bound to be insufficient. And the reason is that the concept of neural code um, ignores key aspects of the perceptual work, which are the formation of objects, building objects, and building a scene with relations between objects. And only when this is done, can you define variables which are properties of those objects and all the scenes. Now, many people have described this way of thinking with codes and computing with codes, adding stuff, uh, based on the manipulation of codes as inspired by the computer. And some see that as a good thing because, well, uh, computers are amazing. And some see it more negatively as somehow a loose metaphor based on the you know, techno technological wonder of the day. But anyway, neural codes were discussed before computers were part of the life. Uh, you can see, for example, in Adrian's work, even when he doesn't use the term code, that's uh, exactly in, in this concept anyway. So I don't think that um, the computer metaphor is actually the, the most relevant uh, way to see the, the, this issue. Uh, somehow the neural coding paradigm depicts the brain as a collection of agents involved in filling predetermined forms, which are the tuning curves, which can be multidimensional, but they, the kind of forms, like the orientation tuning form, and then they pass these forms to each other. And what specific uh, of a form is that the form has a specific meaning. What you have in a form has a meaning that is relative to the form, and the form is rigid. And this is the way the visual system tends to be depicted. Some neurons fill the orientation tuning form in V1 and then pass the form along, um, you know, up the hierarchy up to the Jennifer Aniston neuron and the Jennifer Aniston form, for example. And when, when I'm using the word bureaucracy here, I, I'm not using it pejoratively necessarily, just um, descriptively. And once upon a time, like a century ago or more, bureaucracy was not a pejorative word. Max Weber, for example, who theorized bureaucracy, uh, thought it was the most efficient way to organize a company. And if you think about it, um, communists thought it was a rational scientific way to organize production. You know, you have a problem, you divide it in small pieces. Each piece can be understood independently and can be done by a different person specialized for that task. All of this is very Cartesian thinking. What could go wrong? And it's only recently that we realized that it doesn't work actually. And, but somehow it has remained intellectually attractive. And why does it not work? Well, because the bureaucracy is rigid. 
you can't get anything else than, uh, done than something that is already in the form. And so let's take an example, back to the example of the cat's sound localization. You have neurons that are tuned to sound location somewhere in the brainstem. And so you say this neurons activity represents sound location. That's fine in an experimental context of a lab where you present stimulus and it has a position. But in real life, it's really like that. In real life, sometimes you have no source, sometimes you have two sources, sometimes you have the sound of the wind or of a river. So what, what happens if you have two sounds? What form is this neuron going to feel and what meaning is it going to have for the neurons who deal with that form? So what a strange analogy if you think about it, bureaucracy for something that is supposedly the brain, the most amazing information process of the known universe. So far, I have discussed the features of abstraction and flexibility, the first two features of representation. And these are important problems with uh, neural coding discourse. But now I will now uh, discuss, um, I think, deeper problem, which is the problem of verifiability. And so there's a deep problem in the idea that a neural code can be a representation, and that's that, that idea Mark Bichard uh, calls encodingism. And the problem is that a code is a very particular kind of information. It's information by reference to something else, something else that it is outside the brain. And it's meaningful only to the extent that that thing outside the brain is meaningful. Now, the problem is that that something else that is referred to is outside the brain. So, so how does the brain know that the representation is correct, that it actually represents the right thing um, and not something else? Well, of course, it cannot go outside of itself and check. And so Eccles, so you know, Eccles was a um, uh, very known physiologist. He got, he got the Nobel Prize. And he, um, he wrote this about this problem. In response to sensory stimulation, I experienced a private perceptual world, which must be regarded neurophysiologically as an interpretation of specific events in my brain. Hence, I'm confronted by the problem. How can this diverse cerebral patterns of activity give me valid pictures of the external world? And well, what did Eccles conclude? Well, Eccles, who was a very logical man, concluded to a dualism. He was a convinced dualist. He thought that because of this, there must be something else than the brain that, that is in the business of interpreting and interpreting the activity of these neurons. He actually wrote a book with another hero of, of uh, biologist, um, Karl Popper, on this. So he was a dualist. That's the logical conclusion, in fact, of encodingism, the idea that a code, just by virtue of being a correspondence, can be a representation. Uh, now, if we reject dualism, this raises the issue of what Big Heart calls uh, system detectable error. The organism cannot check whether the representation is an error. In other words, it's not actually a representation. And I would go one step further. It's not just that the organism cannot detect errors. It's rather than the idea of a code does not allow for the possibility of an error. Because think about it. How, it, how would it look like if this representation, those spy trains were uh, in error? Well, it would just look like another bunch of spy trains. Uh, if you change the correspondence, what you get is a different code. It's not an erroneous code. There's just no place for error in the concept of a neural code as representation. So it's wrong to identify a neural code with a representation for this reason. Uh, now, one option is to reject representations altogether as incoherent. And a number of authors have defended that position. 
For example, the uh, roboticist Ronnie Brooks has famously said that the world is its own model, which means that you don't need to represent the world, you just need to interact with it. So complex behavior can emerge not from complex models, but from interaction with a complex world. And this view has gained some momentum. It has introduced some very important concepts like embodiment and situatedness. And one of its merits is to dispose of the homunculus by considering autonomous systems in a closed loop with the environment. So there's no more stimulus and response. It's the organism that initiates behavior, thereby creating sensory signals, which then modulate behavior. So the relation between organism and environment is one of coupling, not one of command. Now, just to take a simple example, consider again the problem of localizing a sound source. Um, you hear a sound on the right, you turn your, your head towards the louder ear and you stop when sound intensity is the same at both ears. So here you just use an interaction with the environment to infer the sense direction. And, and that's in a way that works actually for a variety of sounds. So you do have this property of abstraction. Uh, there is a diversity of views in anti-representationalism, but generally it's based on feedback, like this example. You have, for example, Powers' perceptual control theory, which claims that the goal of behavior is to maintain the stimulus constant. And so this is undoubtedly a, an important aspect of behavior, feedback. But the problem is that the cat does much more than that. So here the mouse would scratch the grass for a very short time, and then only the cat runs. And this whole time, the cat is behaving as a function of something that is absent. And so feedback wouldn't help in that case. So there is still something important in representations that needs to be explained. And that thing is anticipation. So this justifies to take a pragmatic view. That is to say, to look at the consequences of having representations. What are representations for? So there was a book that my uh, kid had when it was uh, three years old and I lost it, so uh, it's not uh, the illustrations from the book, but similar, but it explains this concept of pragmatic representation. So in the book, different animals stumble on a potty, and then the frog says, oh, a bathtub. And then the dog says, oh, a ball. And then the mouse says, oh, a slide. And so the same object, the same image, is seen differently by three animals because they have different umwelts. And the umwelt is the environment in what it means for the organism. So the body is seen as something you can have a bath in or something that you can eat in or something that you can slide on. So that's essentially Gibson's concept of affordances. You perceive the possibilities of interaction you can have. In that sense, you have a pragmatic notion of representation. What is interesting in this pragmatic, pragmatic view is that it clarifies the notion of verifiability. The frog can check whether it can actually take a bath in the potty. So this is something that the frog and not the observer can do. So it's a notion of verifiability, which is from the perspective of the organism and not of the observer. Um, so that's a concept of representation that is better founded than encodingism. Now, you find this notion in several unorthodox theories of perception. For example, more than a century ago, Poincaré wrote um, that to localize an object is, um, cela signifie simplement que nous nous représentons les mouvements qu'il faut faire pour atteindre cet objet. Translate, this means simply that we represent to ourselves the movements that we need to do in order to reach that object. Um, Kevin Oregon, uh, who developed the uh, sensory motor theory of perception, wrote, vision is a mode of exploration of the world that is mediated by knowledge on the part of the perceiver of what we call sensory motor contingencies. And finally, Big Heart, which I mentioned earlier, um, wrote, representation is constituted in pragmatic, future-oriented oriented indications of potentialities for interaction in complex interactive agents. And so there's a common theme in these propositions, 
perception or representation is seen not, uh, not as a thing, like a painting, but more as an activity, something we do. And this, I guess, is not intuitive. So I'll give a little thought experiment to explain. And I guess that will be my only slide in consciousness. Um, we think that our conscious experience is produced by the brain. And so as materialists, we think that there must be a lawful relation, that is a relation of encoding between the state of a brain at a given time and the percept that we, we are experiencing at that time. Now, here for the thought experiment. When I was a kid, there was a TV series called Bewitched. And in Bewitched, uh, Samantha that you see here, um, she's a housewife, but actually she's a witch. And she can twitch her nose. And when she does that, everyone freezes, except her. And then she twitches her nose again, and everyone unfreezes without noticing that anything happened in between. So for them, time has stopped, effectively. So now I'm asking the question, what were people experiencing while time was frozen? Now, according to encodigism, well, they have been experiencing the same percept corresponding to the unchanged state of the brain during that whole time. But that's not what happened in TV series, apparently. And so if we believe in TV series, that suggests that perceiving is another thing, but uh, rather an activity. So perhaps representation should be con conceived not as a painting, but as a process, something we do. And so I make this claim, neural activity is actually activity. It's not symbols. That is, a spike is some kind of action, something that has a particular effect like a contraction, the depolarization of another neuron. And if you look at the anatomy of the nervous system, you can see a deeply intertwined network of neurons interacting with each other on, on short time scales, coupled with the body and the environment. And so here, spikes simply mediate the interactions in this dynamical system. But when you measure something, so you count the number of spikes in some time window, and then you say it's a representation of some property, then effectively you're disposing of the notion of activity. It's not events anymore. And you consider that it's something that goes into a form that is then read by an observer, something like a painting that you could manipulate and pass along. So now sparks become forms that get exchanged through some bureaucratic structure, but that structure is made up. An action potential is a particular kind of action. It's not the form. So the questions we ask ourselves should not be what does the spiking of those neurons represent, because that's a question for the external observer, but what are the representational properties of these processes that interact by spikes? And so pragmatically, uh, you could ask whether the behavior mediated by the system shows properties of abstraction. For example, if and how um, the behavior is determined by the location of a sound and not some other contextual features, you can ask about the anticipatory properties of the system and how these anticipations may be improved. So of course, this uh, different view re requires a lot of uh, theoretical work, but it is better founded than uh, encodigism. Now, crucially here, representational properties thought in this way in terms of processes are properties not of components, but properties of the system. And so you cannot uh, take a reductionist approach to the problem. And what does it mean to understand a system? I give a couple more, couple more examples to um, sort of contrast it to, to traditional approaches in neuroscience. And so what you see here is an advertisement for the Manchester Metro. Uh, you see these three gears in, and the slogan is making the city work together. So I have a look at it for, for a few seconds. Um, now it takes a little moment. Yes, you got it. It takes a little moment to understand that these gears cannot turn together, um, which is why this 
you can find this on the internet. It's um, subject of, uh, of jokes, of course. Um, now, if one turns clockwise, then two and three must turn anti-clockwise. But if two turns anti-clockwise, then three must turn clockwise. So you have contradiction. It's not possible. So these three gears actually cannot work together. Uh, now, let's say A and B are two brains. How do you know which one is healthy and which one is diseased? And to understand that, you must look not at gears, um, you know, must look at gears not in isolation and not even in pairs, actually. You must understand its logic as a system. And for example, you would come up with a theorem that says that a system of gears is workable if and only if its graph of interaction can be colored with two colors so that the two connect so that two connected gears have different colors. Okay. Uh, so that's an approach that is very different from the neural coding approach. It focuses not on what neuron activity correlates with, but on how uh, they interact together. And that's a very different thing. Um, so this is the end of, of this talk. So the key message uh, I want to pass here is that the concept of neural representations doesn't capture what we mean, or at least what we should mean if we're serious, um, what we should mean by representation. And it doesn't capture that for empirical reasons because they're not actually abstract or flexible. And, and for theoretical reasons, more deeper, because they are not verifiable. A correspondence is not a rep representation by the simple virtue of being a correspondence. So they are basically neuroscientific instances of Cartesian dualism dualism where you have one part that codes, another that decodes. Uh, what I suggest instead is to think in terms of pragmatic properties of interactional systems, so pragmatic in the sense that we focus on what they do and how they do it. So I gave the reference of, uh, of this paper where you find uh, detailed arguments and also about 25 commentaries in my response. So thank you.